in the West, there are still a few good men left. Men of God, like the circuit-riding preachers of old. Proclaiming truth like the holy prophets of old. Strong and bold. You're about to hear politically incorrect, but biblically correct truth from circuit riding preacher Peter Peters, whose home base is a radio ranch nestled in the Laramie River Valley near Laramie, Wyoming. The radio ranch is a working cattle and horse ranch where circuit riding preacher Peter Peters broadcasts nightly worldwide on the Scriptures for America Worldwide Broadcasting Network, reaching the world through satellite, radio, television, shortwave, and the World Wide Web. Writing for the brand, he preaches for the man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. His circuit not only includes a radio ranch outreach in Wyoming, but also the LaPorte Church of Christ, located at the base of the colorful Colorado Rocky Mountains in LaPorte, Colorado, where he has preached for over 30 years. The message is preached there by Dr. Peters on Sunday morning or streamed live on the Internet and are archived at the ministry website, scriptures4america.org. Dr. Peters' politically incorrect but biblically correct sermons are available on CD and DVD. Many in America, Canada, and all over the world are on the free CD and DVD ministry. Our address will be given at the end of this broadcast. And now, here is Dr. and Pastor Peter John Peters with the Word of God. The message titled Judeo-Christian Ethic. In that message, I showed the history of the Christian church from the time of the apostles and the early church fathers up until today. And I believe that in that series, I gave it one afternoon at Greeley, Colorado, some ten years ago, And I believe in that afternoon I proved that there has been an ongoing battle between the Christian movement and the Antichrist, or those who oppose all that Christ taught. Christ said that if you're not with me, you're against me. And if you don't teach what he teaches, what he taught us, then you're against him. And if that be the case, As far as I'm concerned, that makes you an Antichrist. Down through the years, the opponents of the Christian way have caused many changes that have been made in the gospel that Christ taught. There have been many, many changes. Those changes have been so extensive and so profound that today there is a name for that modified Christianity. We do have a name for it. It is called Judeo-Christianity. Simply, that means an amalgamation or a combining of Judaism and Christianity. The name itself tells us what it is. We in the identity movement are the only known Christians that I at least know of who openly, openly, There are many who may teach it privately, but who openly and publicly teach the evils of that combining and why we, as Christians, should not accept the mongrelization of the Christian faith. And that is exactly what it is. It is a mongrelization of Christianity. There is no such thing as Judeo-Christianity. None whatsoever. Because of all of the knowledge that has been gained since I gave that discussion, that presentation ten years ago, there is a need to once again tell the history of the of the modern Judeo Christian church and how it came about. I have titled this message Ancient Phariseeism Unchecked, and it will be in three parts. History is overflowing with specific incidents that make up the slow but steady changing of Christian doctrine to that that we now call Judeo-Christian thought. Of necessity, I will only be able to pick up on the more important high spots, but if we had the time, one could speak for hours on end 
for weeks at a time to bring forth all of the little incidents. There are books abound with the information that I'm going to present to you in a very brief form. But I will only be able to speak on the highlights. As we step back and take an overall look at the history of the Christian faith or the Christian church, we can readily see that the combining or the modernization of Christianity with Judaism, that combining amalgamation of Christianity with Judaism has been a one-way affair. It hasn't been a two-way street. There hasn't been an open exchange of ideas. Judaism has not changed, not one iota, at least with respect to Christianity. Only Christianity has changed to bring it more into the teachings of Judaism. We must understand that. There is no give and take. The authority that the modern-day Judeo-Christian church, the authority that they use, the preachers of today, that authority that they use to make that change in their statement that Christianity came from Judaism. They make that combination, this thing called Judeo-Christianity, they make the authority for that by simply stating that Christianity sprang from Judaism. This is one, and perhaps even the greatest, untruth in all of the history of the Christian church. This is a great untruth. The rabbis of Judaism is the source. They themselves is the, are the source of this uh, untruth. In a letter from the National Jewish Information Center, its then president, Rabbi Moshe Magel, he made this statement, quote, Please study the enclosed pamphlet, What is a Jew and How to Become a Jew? In this pamphlet, you will notice the great difference between the Jewish and the Christian religions. But these are not all. We consider the two religions so different that one excludes the other. Continuing. Therefore, as you noticed in the ad in which your package was wrapped, and it is enclosed here again, we emphasize that there is no such thing as Judeo-Christian religion. It is true, he says, it is true that in the beginning Christianity was rooted in Judaism. But centuries later, it went far away from its mother religion. So that today there is not any similarity between the two concepts. So Judaism itself says that there is no such thing as Judeo-Christianity. And yet they, they, the rabbis, say that Christianity sprang from Judaism. Now think about it. This statement is incongruent. It is incongruent. You can't get away from it. There is a dichotomy here. He is right when he says that there is no such thing as Judeo-Christianity, but then he is in error when he says that Christianity sprang from Judaism. But there in Judaism, in their belief and in their teaching, is the source of some of the teaching of the modern Christian churches. Their rabbis teach at the seminaries, Christian seminaries. Their rabbis hold interreligious conferences to teach ministers the wonders of Judaism. So they have the opportunity to enter into our Christian seminaries and teach that, Judea, that Christianity sprang from Judaism. And of course, they also teach that there's no such thing as Judeo-Christianity. So it is they themselves 
in our own Christian seminaries teaching our ministers of modern-day Judeo-Christianity the idea that Christianity sprang from Judaism. Now we're faced with a question. What is the truth? What is the truth? How did it all come about? Let's start in the book of Luke. If you would, turn to the book of Luke, chapter 1. We will start reading in verse 68. This, These verses in Luke 1, starting in the latter portions of the chapter, are very, very powerful verses. And you don't hear much of it in all of Judeo-Christianity because there's a key here that we need to understand. Zacharias, if you will recall, was looking at his newborn son, John, John the Baptist, and he was prophesying about the coming Messiah, starting in verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us, his people, in the house of his servant David as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we, his people, should be saved from our enemies and from the hands of those that hate us, of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swear to our father Abraham, our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, John the Baptist, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of sins. So Jesus was to come to Israel. He was to come to save Israel from its enemies. Jesus himself stated who he came for. In Matthew 15 and in verse 24, he said this, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, just as Zacharias prophesied. He gave the same instructions to the disciples in Matthew 10 and verse 5 and 6. He said this, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He gave two witnesses to that request, to those instructions. Jesus didn't come to the Jews. Jesus came to save Israel. There was no such thing as Jews when Israel was deported into the city of the Medes and Habor. But who is it, who was it that hated genuine Israel and wanted to destroy it? Who was it? Just, can we put names on them? Can we just, if we were alive at that time, touch them? Who was it? that hated Israel and wanted to destroy it. We must go to the time between the Testaments to start our search between the Old and the New Testament. It is here, during that period of time, between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew, several hundred years, between that time, there was much that happened that we are living with today. And we must start our discussion tonight 
with that period of time because it is so very important to understanding how we got Judeo-Christianity. In the book of Ezra, chapter 2, Ezra tells us that Ezra brought back to Jerusalem from the Babylonian 70-year captivity nearly 43,000 Israelites of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. The largest share of those who went into captivity in Babylon stayed there in Babylon. And they became acquainted and they acquired the Babylonian Talmud. The Talmud was developed there in Babylon over many, many years. And it is a mixture of the Babylonian religion with the Kabbalah and a little bit of the teachings of the ancient prophets of Israel. In other words, the Talmud is genuinely a mongrelization of several religions. It is not just one faith, but understand this, it is their religious book. It is their lifeblood. It is that book that they hold paramount in all of their doctrine, in all of everything they are convicted to believe and do. God, in all of his infinite wisdom and in his judgment, he brought forth Alexander of Macedonia. Alexander is known as Alexander the Great. He was born in 356 B.C., and he started his conquest of the then known world for world power in 334. He was just a young man. He captured all of the known civilization or civilized world of the time. He made his headquarters in, of all places, Babylon. The very location where the Babylonian Talmud has and was being developed by those who then called themselves Jews. Alexander died at the tender age of 33, and he was crying because he had no more worlds to conquer. He had conquered all of the known world at the time. Now, in my judgment, God brought him forth. He had him do what he was to do, and it was also God's judgment, I believe, to bring his death at an early age. Alexander's program, and this will be very, very familiar to you. Alexander's program was to make a one-world government, a one-world people, and a one-world religion. Doesn't that sound familiar to us? Doesn't it sound like modern America, modern Europe? I might say modern Christian America, modern Christian Europe. Doesn't it sound familiar? Why? And what was it? Who, are, who started the teaching? And what is it that is the lifeblood of doing this one world government, this one world religion, and this one world people? The same concepts have been brought forth all of these years. <coughs> Alexander encouraged interracial marriage. He encouraged it, practically insisted upon it, by giving rewards to those who did intermarry. He developed the library at Alexandria in Egypt, where he gathered leaders from all of the various religious groups, which included Orientalists, Talmudic Jews, Egyptians, Greeks, and a few of those Israelites, those Israelite Israel priests who were still around at the time. Very few of them. It was exactly like the interreligious conferences that I earlier spoke of that is being accomplished by the modern day, day Jews and in their establishment of those conferences. A commingling of Gnosticism, the occult, the Kabbalah, and the system of symbolism and allegory was developed there in Alexandria at that time. And it was all under the direction, the command, 
of Alexander of Macedonia. The people of the region were required to learn Greek in order to survive. The second language was the Aramaic. The ancient Hebrew, spoken of by only a minority of true Israelites, began to be lost. Even the few Israelites in the area lost their native tongue. Modern Hebrew, those block letters that you see in modern Hebrew text, is Yiddish. It is not Hebrew. It is not the ancient Hebrew of Israel. It hadn't even been developed yet. There is a vast difference in the style of writing of ancient Hebrew versus the modern Yiddish Hebrew. Tremendous difference in, in the manner it was put down and, and what was being said. So, with this knowledge, during the Hebrew religious service by those few Hebrew priests that were there, the congregation couldn't understand these priests as they conducted the services. They, it was just totally un, 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 uh, uh, not understandable by them. It was here that the word scribes, it was here that the scribes were developed. They came into being for the purpose of translating the Hebrew rituals into Greek and Aramaic. Pretty soon the scribes realized that they could do the job without the priests. And all they would need to do is simply state in Greek and Aramaic what the Hebrew priests would have said had they been there talking in Hebrew and then being translated. Now you can readily see what is about to happen. That was bad enough. The scribes replaced the priests in their priestly duties because the people couldn't understand the Hebrew language. That was bad enough. So these scribes soon learned that all they needed to do was to start teaching some of those doctrines, some of those dogmas, some of that new learning that was being taught at the library there in Alexandria by that interreligious task force that Alexander the Great forced upon the people in order to amalgamate the religions. So allegories, symbolism, were added with the Kabbalistic teaching. The name that has been given in history to this concept of the scribes putting together and adding to what the ancient Hebrew priests would have said are called targums. That is the name that was given to what was being done by these scribes. They were also called par paraphrases, but the word itself is targum. During this period of time, another phenomenon took place. A highly secret, highly secret society known as the Pharisees grew into tremendous power. The Pharisees had earlier originated in Babylon itself, and they moved back to Palestine. This secret society was very similar in structure to modern Freemasonry. Very similar in structure. The Pharisees further developed the Babylonian Talmud with its oral laws and the reinterpretation of the scriptures. They used the allegories and the symbolism developed at Alexandria. Now it is important to note that they, the Pharisees, considered all those outside of that highly secret society as Yom Heretz. That was the word they gave to all non-Pharisees that were not initiates of that highly secret society. Yom Heretz. That people, or they called it, or the people of the land. The simpleton. This corresponds to the word goyim. Of course, true Israelites who didn't believe in all of this nonsense, just like we here 
don't believe in all of that nonsense. There were many Israelites right there who said, Hogwash, I don't believe this. But those who didn't believe of this nonsensical point of view were the enemies, not only of the Pharisees, but all of the rest of those piled higher and deepers there in Alexandria. So the genuine Hebrew was an enemy of the whole bunch of them. Just exactly like we here in this room tonight are forced, placed in the same position. We don't believe it. We don't believe there's anything such thing as Judeo-Christianity. And who is it that has poking at us the hardest? Who is it? So there's nothing new under the sun. So now we have defined the enemies that Zechariah spoke of in Luke 1. We can now understand why Jesus said he came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We can now understand why he condemned the Pharisees and the scribes because he came into that environment. We can understand so many of the words of the Master now because of what we now know happened in that period of time between the Testaments. We can also realize the power that these Pharisees wielded. It was tremendous power. And you must understand that there is similar tremendous power by secret societies today of all walks and stripes. Tremendous power of the same type that was existing even then. They became the power, the Pharisees, behind the emperor and the legislation of the Roman Empire. Make no bones about it. You are being told that they were condemned, castigated, and hunted down just like the Christians were hunted down. Not so. They were a power behind the throne of the Roman Empire. There are many books written today by they themselves, by modern-day Talmudic Jews, who write of the influence they exercised in the Roman legislation. Now you can understand the actions of Herod. Now you can understand the actions of Pontius Pilate. Who was it that directed Pontius Pilate? He didn't do this on his own. He didn't dare do this on his own. Someone pulled his string. We are now discussing who pulled his string. We can readily see how easy it was for the Pharisees to have Jesus the Christ crucified. It was no better whatsoever, not one iota better in that immediate time after the resurrection of Jesus. The fledgling Christian movement made up of Israelites, Christian Israel, that is who he came for and that is who he told the great stories of the gospel. Christian Israel. It is that fledgling Christian movement made up of Israelites who were living daily in the fear of their lives. The history of the carnage that was perpetrated by these enemies of Christ on these Israelites is common knowledge in both the Christian and in the secular history books. And in my library, I have book after book discussing all of the evil and the carnage that took place at that time. But it wasn't much different than it is right now. There have been perhaps 100 million Christians killed since World War II. Our people were hunted down for extermination, no matter where they were. When Joseph Arimathea took that small band to England, southwest England, there at Avalon, Glastonbury, very shortly after the resurrection, the Roman Empire 
followed him. England came under attack by the Roman Empire by direction in A.D. 45. That was just a few years. That was just a few years following the resurrection. But the Romans never could destroy the fledgling Christian movement there at Avalon. It showed the power that God had given us if we were to just understand it. They never could turn that little Christian band into submission. Why? Because they knew they were being resurrected and they fought with such ferocity, with such furor, that the Roman legions couldn't overcome them. They got up so far, but no farther. There are many books written on this subject, wonderful books that warm the heart. Paul understood the conflict between the Pharisees and the Christian movement in his letter to the church at Corinth and the epistles to Timothy and Titus. He discusses the conflict that had already started to modify Christ's teachings. Now if you would turn with me to the book of Titus, chapter 1. Here in the book of Titus, starting in chapter 1, Paul talks about this conflict that he was trying to impress upon his people at that time. He stated this, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. And that has continued ever since. They of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, just as is today, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. By the millions they're raking it in, teaching you things that they ought not. Continuing. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said that Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men, Phariseeism, Talmudic Phariseeism, that turn from the truth. So Paul was trying his best at the time to counter the efforts of the Pharisees. And he should know exactly what Phariseeism was all about. He was one. He knew Phariseeism from the inside out. We know that the Pharisees, that these people were Pharisees because Paul tells them, or tells, of giving heed to the commandments of men that turn from the truth. Commandments of men is the Talmud and it is Pharisaical Judaism. Continuing time, continuing in time, the organized power of the Sadducees was destroyed in A.D. 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus. The Pharisees were greatly weakened. They were nearly destroyed. Their power at the time was diminished nearly to zero. But they still wielded that power that they, rem that they had remaining <clears throat> over, the, over Rome and the efforts to destroy Christianity because they were a secret society. They could do what they needed to do covertly. There was nothing overt about what was being done. They went underground and did what they needed to do secretly. Martin Luther understood this. When he nailed his thesis to the Wurttemberg Cathedral doors, he wanted only the church to remove those heresies. And he wrote books on the subject. Where did the heresies come from? They were not self-sustaining. They were not self-developing. Ideas were given to them. Penetrations were made in secret by these men who had gone 
covert. The modern day Lutheran church doesn't teach what Martin Luther taught. They deny the writings and the teachings of Martin Luther. That is one, but one example of how far we have decayed in our theology. Dr. George Fisher of Yale University in 1898, when Yale was still a Christian college, he had this to say. The question for the student, that's us, to to determine is, how far have the ancient creed, their authors and expounders, that will be the apostles, the disciples, and Jesus Jesus himself, gone beyond an intellectual equivalent of the New Testament teaching. How far have they removed themselves from New Testament teaching? Another well-known theologian, Dr. Charles Hodge, he confirmed what Dr. Fisher had to say, and we quote him, The power of individual men who would appear in special junctures over the faith and character of coming generations is something portentous. Of such world controllers, at least in modern times, there are none to compare with Martin Luther, Ignatius Loyola, and John Wesley. Remember those three names. Though so different from each other, each has left his impress upon millions of men. Our only security from the fallible or perverting influence of man is the entire unquestioning summation to the infallible word of God. Now we have to understand that and we have to believe it. That is our rock. We have to understand this, but we have to understand what it says and not what we're taught out of these modern seminaries. As we continue with the history of how Judeo-Christianity was formed, we will see that Dr. Hodge didn't include all of them by any means. But that conflict, discussed by so many men, including the apostles themselves, is no longer discussed by modern theologians. They don't talk about the conflict anymore. We have the Ecumenical Council attempting to return all denominations to that, basically, of the Church of Rome. That is a very, very powerful movement today. We have Jewish rabbis teaching in the seminaries, and if you don't believe that, go to any one of them. That is what happens. We have interreligious conferences to teach tolerance on the part of Christianity, that is. And if anyone dares <clears throat> to disagree with the established doctrine, he is pounced upon with accusations of bigotry. Have anybody heard of this? Racism, anti-Semitism, hatred, and Christian fundamentalism. And it is rapidly becoming illegal to be called any of these. That is how far we have come. There is a conflict, and there has been a conflict since before, before the birth of Christ. The opposing side of that contract is allowed to discuss it. They can discuss it any time they want. Gerson D. Cohen, in his book titled The Great Ideas and Ages of the Jewish People, wrote this, and I quote Gerson Cohen. One other source for the self-conscious assertion of the election must be mentioned. For here, strangely enough, the Jews were the cause of their own embarrassment. The effectiveness of Jewish missionary activity, it is well known, immeasurably facilitated Christian preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles. In other words, it was their own missionary activity and its lack of effectiveness actually that was part and parcel to the facilitating the Christians ability to get to the gospel to the nations and the tribes and they admit this 
And of course, we know that God was in, in command. We continue. What is often glossed over is the claim of the Christian preachers to represent the true Israel. Their contention that the new sect was the rightful heir to God's revelation to the patriarchs. This is Gerson Cohen talking. Moses and the prophets. Who was the rightful heir is what he is saying. To the Talmudic community, he says, beginning with the second century, often found itself forced to defend its claim to the title of Israel. One of the deep sources of tension between Judaism and Christianity. Who was Israel? Christianity said, we are Israel, and they were right. Judaism said, we're going to take it, and they were wrong. He says that none of this, these sources of tension happened between the Jewish-Muslim relations. And he says it was the debate of two pretenders to the same title. For reasons of prudence, and think about what he is now saying, prudence. Why is he saying prudence? For reasons of prudence. The Christian church later chose not to emphasize the question of the Israelite name, but claim to succession is one which the church never has given up. The Jew, in turn, all the more aggressively, affirmed his lineage and his election against all pretenders. Jacob was again at war with Esau over the primal birthright. This is Gerson Cohen writing this. So the rabbis knew the truth, didn't they? They know it. They knew that there was a conflict about who was Israel and who was the pretender. Yes, in my mind, Jacob is again at war with Esau over the primal birthright. And we in our movement are bringing it to the front. We are at war over the primal birthright. But today, the modern Judeo-Christian churches, they seem to have a case of mistaken identity. We are at war with Esau over the primal birthright. So there has developed a new Christian faith. As Sir James Fraser stated in his book, The Golden Bow, that by the year 200 A.D., Christianity, as taught by Jesus Christ, had all but disappeared. Those are serious charges. But it's true. Maybe Sir James Fraser was a little bit off in his timing, but we can certainly agree that he was right for the year 1993. I read many statements by... Jewish authors that state something like Christianity is a little bit Jewish and a whole lot heathen worship. Now, that should upset a true, true Christian, and it certainly upset me, because Christian Israel is neither a little bit Jewish nor a whole lot heathen. The history books are there to, taught, to be taught in the seminaries and to be read by our ministers. And as we shall see as we continue with this study, the heresies that came into the Christian church were put there by the Pharisees' efforts to destroy everything the Messiah came to teach. Why did he come? They were there teaching, penetrating with heresies for the very purpose of destroying Christian Israel. Now we must remember that the early church fathers did not have a New Testament, but only the writings of the Old Testament. There was no New Testament at the time of the apostles. The New Testament had not become a canon or canonized until for nearly 200 more years. So there was no New Testament. And when, and when Jesus says, search the scriptures, he is talking about the Old Testament, not the New Testament. So they entered into their small groups, Christians. 
to discuss the teachings of Jesus and the apostles. The book of Acts tells us of some of the activities of the Antichrist in their, in their attempts to destroy Christianity. But probably the most dangerous opponents to the Christians were those who quietly joined the small studies groups. History tells us that whenever this happens, eventually the small group become a large group and separate it. They separate within themselves to develop major organizations. And this is what happens. So when penetration took place into these small groups, the, the heresies were brought with them. And as these heresies were brought in and it was added to it over and over, the whole conflict, heresies and all, grew. And eventually they then divided and went elsewhere for more heresies to be brought in. The history books abound with the stories of these heresies. And if we are truthful and if we search it out, we will see where these heresies came from. After the resurrection of Jesus and during and shortly after the period of the apostles, the Christian followers divided into two schools of thought. And we're now getting to a very important part of how we became known as Judeo-Christians. One headquarters was at Alexandria in Egypt, right back there where Alexander the Great had formed that, that library there at Alexandria, and he had forced this interreligious task force to get together for a one-world government, a one-world religion, and a one-world people. So one school of thought was at Alexandria, and the other was at Antioch, Greece. The two schools of thought. It's very important to understand what those two schools of thought, uh, uh, two schools of thought, what they taught. Keep in mind what has been said about Alexandria, uh, Alexander. It was there in Alexandria nearly 300 years before the birth of Christ where these heresies started to be hatched and started to be dreamed of. That's where they were established. When Alexander forced the commingling of all of these peoples into one big room and he locked the door until they came on an agreement. The Christian school that was formed there at Alexandria shortly after the resurrection would naturally, and I believe that we can all understand that, they would naturally assume the teachings, at least and in part, to some degree or another, the teachings of the earlier efforts of Alexander the Great. It would only be natural because all of the people were right there. The, 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 the buildings were there in great terms, and the, the uh, uh, descendants of <clears throat> those people who were there studying were right there in the Alexandria area. And so that thought, obviously, was foremost in people's minds. The school taught that the Christians... The, uh, the philosophies of Gnosticism taught the allegories. They taught the dualism. They taught the Gnostics that they considered themselves capable of having a deeper insight or knowledge of divine things that was open, or not open to the ordinary person. So when you, that is Gnosticism, when you believe because you belong to this Gnostic society, that you have a deeper insight to divine things and the belief, the thoughts and the teachings of the Bible, etc., than the person who doesn't have the secret uh, knowledge that the, that the Gnostics teach, uh, then you yourself have become a Gnostic. The Gnostics consider themselves such people. The School of Alexandria taught the rituals and the ordinances of the Pharisaical Jews. They taught extensively in the supernatural angiology and demonology. And this you must bring forth in some of your thinking now as to how Judeo-Christianity, uh, how it became what it is today. All of these concepts came from the commingling of religions that Alexander the Great forced upon the people there at Alexandria. 
Out of the Christian school in Alexandria came the heretical sects, such as the Pharisee of the Ebionites, which were also called Nazarenes, the Essenic Ebionites, the Ophites, the Marcionites, and the Manichaeans. All of these sects came from the school at Alexandria. From the Alexandrian school, they obtained astrology and the use of allegories. The system of allegory is where a word or a verse says one thing and it means something else. It is a system of an exchange of thought, saying one thing, meaning something else. Mysticism was prevalent in the Alexandrian school. Dr. Fisher, again, at Yale University, he discussed the idea of mysticism, and he said that it is the synonym, <coughs> the, sin, the synonym of ecstasy. It is the thought that feeling is a direct source of knowledge. Now, be thinking about what we're saying here. The feeling is a direct source of knowledge. The mystic undervalues the scriptures. He also discards reason and science. Dr. Yale of uh, Dr. Fisher of Yale University is saying this. He also says that pietism was established at Alexandria. And he says that pietism is the feeling of emotionalism as compared to substance. So be thinking now about Judeo-Christianity in general and what we are supposed to be doing. On the other hand, the Christian school of Antioch disagreed with the Alexandrian school. They discarded Gnosticism, threw it away. They discarded the allegories and they discarded the dualism. Yin and yang, good and bad, heaven and hell etc., etc., wet and dry, male and female, the dualism of the Zoroasterism of the Orient. They discarded the teachings of the ordinances and the rituals of the Pharisaical Jews. Their theology was ethical in nature. They taught with a scholarly spirit and developed character in the morals of a person. They taught the exercise of moral choice. They taught that Jesus Christ came not only to deliver man from sin, but to raise him up to a higher plane of development. The school of Alexander taught, I mean, school of Antioch taught that Christianity was a way of life. Jesus said it is the way. They taught that Christianity was based on more on the rationalism of the scriptures than mysticism. They taught that substance was what we should be studying instead of emotionalism. Justin Martyr was a student at Antioch, and he was then a teacher. He said that Christianity is the doctrine of virtue and the rewards and punishments that come with it. He said that Christ is the Logos or Word and those who live according to reason that are presented in the Scriptures are Christian. And of course, obviously, along with baptism. Justin said that Christ cleansed by His blood those who believe on Him by his blood and the mystery of the cross he bought us Justin Martyr said those things so there is a brief description of the two schools it shouldn't be hard for us to discern which one comes closer to the truth but I want to point out that it is the Alexandrian school that modern theologians consider the more scholarly. Isn't this strange? They say it is more philosophical and more scientific. It is impossible for me, just little old me, to understand where the studies of allegories, where the studies of Gnosticism, mysticism, the Kabbalah, 
and all of the rest of this is more studious. How can you say that is more studious than using reason and the scriptures? But it is easy for me to understand that it was the Alexandrian school that gave us the bulk of modern-day Judeo-Christian thought and doctrine. We will continue, God willing, with the history of what is called the Judeo-Christian Christian ethic in the next message. Because of time limitations, we have to be brief. But what I want to do is my intentions are simply to whet your appetite. I want you to go out of here, find the books, go ahead and study it for yourself. Don't believe me. Just go in there and dig it out. And you will start to see for your very self why we have Christian, Judeo-Christian ethic today and why there is no such thing as Christian Israel in modern day thought and why we say such things as Jesus was a Jew and why we say such things as we do in Judeo-Christian uh, America today. God willing, we'll continue. God bless you. The preceding message by circuit riding preacher Peter Peters from the Laporte Church Christ, located at the base of the beautiful Colorado Rocky Mountains in Laporte, Colorado, has been aired on the Scripture for America Worldwide Broadcasting Network and is available on CD or DVD and is archived at the website scripturesforamerica.org. Remember, circuit writer, preacher, and teacher Peter Peters broadcasts live nightly from his Wyoming Radio Ranch, nestled in the Laramie, Wyoming River Valley. It's a working horse and cattle ranch where circuit riding preacher Dr. Peters reaches the lost sheep of the House of Israel worldwide on satellite, internet, and shortwave radio. Dial settings 5755 and 9480. Check out the 24-hour, seven days a week web broadcasting website, sfawbn.com. Scriptures for America Worldwide Broadcasting Network is made possible by the prayers and tithes of the faithful. If you want to write to circuit writing preacher Peter Peters, the address is Scriptures for America, P.O. Box 766, LaPorte, Colorado, 80535 or you can visit us on the web at www.scripturesforamerica.org The preacher will be riding back this way next week and hopes you will too.